Hi, and welcome into another edition of the Primary Residential Mortgage Armchair Quarterback. I'm Tony Lombardi here with Drew Foster. We're missing our, our comrade in arms today. I got my sad face on. Yeah. Well, I got my sad face on because we don't have Dean and my really sad <laughs> face because, because the season's over and it ends just like that, right? That, it's abrupt, isn't that it? That was always the weirdest part about like when I was in the soccer business and, and working for the Blast, like the you, you, you put all of this work in and you... You play these games, you get to the playoffs, you have all this momentum. You, you come up to a game like that is do or die or an elimination game. You don't really think about losing. Then the horn ends, the game ends, season's over, and it's over. Like you come to work the next day and there's, there, there isn't anything to do. Right. I mean, there is, but there isn't, right? There are no more games. So it's weird even now, like when you're a fan of a team. And, you know, I was scrambling around last week getting ready for a big bus trip to go to New England because you have to do that. It, it feels sort of counterintuitive knowing sports to put all that work into something that n could not happen if the stars don't align right. right but you have to do it. Pull, the carpet's pulled right but from you have under. To do it. Yeah. You got to get the bus ready. Yeah. You got to call up there and get hotel rooms. You got to start scouting around for tickets. And then as soon as Tucker missed that field goal, as soon as they missed the field goal, I'm like, it, it ain't happening. Not their day. Not today. Yeah, I'm working on a piece right now about you know thanking Joe Flacco for his time served in Baltimore and all the things that he did or accomplished as a Raven. And one of the things I talked about was just the suddenness of the end of a season if you were a playoff participant. Right. Now, if you're one of those teams like the Cincinnati Bengals, they knew they were out of it three weeks before the season was over. You mentally yeah, prepared right, for that. Right. But the suddenness of this is really abrupt. And when you think about the attrition in the NFL, 25% of those guys that were in that locker room are going to be gone. Right. Yeah, just by the nature of the business, right? And you're 53 guys and, you know, they'll have 12 or 14 or 16 new faces. All the draft picks mostly make it. Um, you know, so they'll they'll be a they'll be a um a new group. You know, I mean they'll be a, you know Joe won't be back for sure, and pretty good chance maybe Jimmy Smith's not back, and maybe Weddle won't be back. I mean there'll be some prominent guys gone, and there'll be some middle of the road guys gone too. But um, lots to digest from that game. I ugh, man, I I've gone through so many like ups and downs. I was level headed for a while, then I was angry, then I was you know, one of the embarrassment. Like I've gone up and down, right. up and down. I, it, I was scared. I told you this last week. Like I was scared of the game. I, I, I just felt like things. You know, market correction was coming. Unfortunately, you know, and it was an expensive correction, as I wrote on my website. Like, well, we were always we were due for one of these. Remember, I said that last week. Yeah. Like, we were due for a stinker. It and just, everyone said that the team that had a chance to have seen them before right. might be the team to do it, and that was the Chargers. Right. But the thing that got me, and it came out the guy that's Jeff Zarebeck's colleague at The Athletic that covers the Chargers. Right. Did you read that? That was the huge story. Obviously. That was amazing right. that, you know, that you can tip off plays like that and, and not correct that. It was, Drew, i got to say, it's either incompetence or arrogance. I think it was arrogance because they're not incompetent. But the arrogance of not making any changes – not I know you can't anticipate the changes that another team's going to make, but you've got to be prepared that the other team is going to adjust. And they did, and the Ravens failed to. Right. I mean, obviously the story centered mostly on Ronnie Stanley. I, I, I kind of wonder sometimes when I read those things, like I always go back to qui bono, right, like the Latin phrase for who benefits. Like what, what benefit did you get out of, and if you're in the Chargers locker room, what benefit did you get out of revealing that information? Like I'm not saying they made it up. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm wondering – what else did they see besides that? Right. Besides the, the, the well, I give up the secret. Yeah, I thought I found that to be a little odd in a league where um, you know you're scraping for every single win you can get. They've now told Ronnie Stanley something that potentially he could change in his game to make it more difficult to play against him. So I, I, I don't know. I was a little, I was a little curious about why they would have said that. But to, the the summary of the whole thing is. You know, they, they play with these seven defensive backs, essentially not having a linebacker in there, but they were all kind of linebackers, and they all had speed. And as soon as the ball was snapped, if it was a run, they were quick enough to just get in, plug the holes. Lamar was clearly, whatever word you want to use, rattled, confused, whatever. You know, whatever it is, he, he, he had never seen it before, and they weren't able to adjust. And, and, and it's a pretty – people always say, like, you got to make these in-game adjustments, you got to make these in-game adjustments. True. But you only get the ball 10 or 12 times or 14 times. And by the time you've kind of figured it out, three or four offensive series have gone by, and you're like, okay, 
let's figure this out. Well, by the time you do that, now you're down 12 nothing. Now you're, you know, it, it's not as easy as it appears to the naked eye. Yeah, uh, there's that said, Marty's got to go. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. Ten <laughs> possessions, 50 net yards after 10 possessions. That's inexcusable. Well, it was, I kept looking up at the board, of video board, and I'm like, we, we have six yards passing for the game. I mean, there was a point in the third quarter where the Ravens had six, they had 59 total yards for the game. I mean, it's almost historical, right? I mean, un yeah. unthinkable that they would have been that pedestrian. That's probably a kind word that they were that awful offensively. Um, you know, I, look, I'm not, as I wrote in my website, I'm not a fire, I'm not a fire that person guy. Like, I get it. It's somebody's job and their livelihood. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, right? I don't relish firing people. I had to do it when I was in the soccer business. It was one of the hardest things to do is tell a player that you didn't want them anymore or an employee. Um, but I, I, this, this, what happened to me on, to me, what happened Sunday was a fireable offense given the totality of it. That this team might have been good enough to go to the Super Bowl and that you somehow you weren't able to grasp either what might happen or in the course of the game, you weren't able to change it up enough to make it competitive. It's one thing if they lose 33-30, right? If they lose 33-30 and Rivers just has a great game and Keen Allen's got 14 catches for 131 yards and they just beat you, you tip your, tip your hat and say, good job. I mean, it, it, it was a winnable game. We had 59 yards of offense in the fourth quarter. It was crazy. So I, I don't know how they go back to Marty. I, I I kind of think they're going to, but I don't know how you do. I don't know how you go back to him. Well, to his credit, they were able to work through the bye week, get this offensive unit together, and have some form of an offense that got them on a 6 Which one wasn't run. easy. No, not do. easy. Right. Now, Greg Roman, I know, was instrumental in that. But people keep coming back to Mike Vick and Marty's experience with Mike Vick after all the, the dog fiasco. And, mm -hmm. and You know, so... Mike Vick's a different kind of quarterback. He, they might be fast, right? but Mike Vick didn't run an RPO offense. He ran a traditional offense. And now he, he was a running quarterback, but it wasn't like Marty's scheme to resurrect Vick's career. I didn't see right. it that way. Right, and, and and I would say this too about, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to blow my own horn when I say this. I, I still say every time there's a game, I say this the same thing about Lamar. I, I, I think this is what he is. I just think this is it. I, I, I don't think he's bad by any means. And I don't think he's going to be a star in the league, personally. Because I don't think that style works over the long haul. If I'm wrong, when we're doing this six years from now, remind me I said that he wouldn't make it through his first contract and right. re-up. Like, I, I just don't think his style fits with the league. Um, very athletic. Very, you know, I could sit here and tell you all the things, and you would nod your head because we see the same thing, right? right? You can't fumble the ball twice a game. Because you lose 10 yards every time you do it. And he's got a history of that. 30, you, right. 38 games at Louisville, 25 fumbles. Yeah, I mean, so you're, you're, there, there, there are some, you know, leopard spots never go away, right? They just fade a little bit. He, he's, he, he can't keep putting the ball on the ground. Even if you recover them, it's a sack. You've lost six yards, eight yards, 10 yards, whatever it is. You're, so he's got to fix these things. He's got to clearly learn how to throw out of the pocket. His clock's not quick enough. All of those things, by the way, are pretty much can, connected to being a rookie. Yeah, you just don't walk in from college football. It's really a testament to how hard the NFL is, that these kids can play in college and move up a level, and it's so much harder to do than, than it is in college. Um, but it's his team now. I mean, they've made that very clear, right? Yes, it's they his, did. It's his team, and uh, they've got to get him more comfortable in the pocket. And I just I, I feel like he's always going to be this way. He's an athlete. He, I'm not saying he's not a quarterback. I'm saying he's an athlete first. And I think when he – I almost want to say that at halftime they should have gone up to him and just said, look, just let's play, let's, let's play college football for a half and see if we can't get something out of you. Like, let's figure it out. Just you snap it, see what you see, and run with it or throw it. or do Like, oh, I know that sounds stupid and sandlot and sounds like an eighth-grade offense, but I, I don't know, man. They – they, I don't know what they did at the half, but the first series when they came out looked exactly the same as the first half. <laughs> it was awful. Well, would you have gone to Joe? I would have. Um, I would have to shake it up. I would have done a bunch of different things. And I, I thought 
you know, you know this. We've talked a lot on on camera, off camera. You know, I'm a John fan. I'm a Harbaugh fan. Um, I thought he, I thought he had a bad day Sunday. I thought he, I thought the first field goal when they kicked it, it was fourth and three or fourth and two, fourth yep. and whatever it was. You got to go for it. Thirty-two yard line. Got to go for it there. No, no, no. You're talking about the second one. The first one they were on the goal line. They were down. Oh, right, they were right. down by the goal line. And that could have been went against the grain. Might have been him. about. It might have been, but it might have been long. It might have been fourth and three at that point. But again, my the whole thing was I keep saying this over and over. Even when it was twelve three and they kicked the field goal and he eschewed going for it and said afterwards we wanted to make it a one score game. You didn't need three points there. What you really needed was you needed to get the offense on track. Yes. You needed some momentum. You needed something to happen. Particularly Kicking, on the heels of that bl- partially blocked correct. punt. Kicking for three points there, to me, was a concession, I thought. It was a concession by John that said, we're going to try to win 13-12. We're going to make it 12-6 to six now. We're going to steal a touchdown. We're going to hold on for dear life, and we're going to win 13-12. And it go- went against the grain, to your point about the way he had operated all year. Right. And it went against the grain. I, and I always say this about John, and I'm saying this sitting here in this black chair with you. So what do I know? Right? He makes $5 million a year, and I make nothing. But it always is about the feel of the game. The moment, right then. I don't care what the textbook says. I don't care that the book says, don't go for it, go for it, go for two. It's about what you need right now in the moment, the feel for the game. And I thought on Sunday, his feel was, we're going to win 13 and 12. Now, I don't know if he felt this way at the time it was happening. But after the game, he talked about how if they had gone for it on fourth down there and converted it, we were probably going to kick a field goal later right. anyway. That was a telling statement. I'm really glad you brought that up. Because when I heard it, I'm like, huh, what? What would you say? Because I was driving home, and I heard him say that on the postgame show, and I'm like, what? what's he mean by that? And that was almost, that's really the indicative statement to me of you're not thinking clearly. You're not thinking through the thing. You need some momentum. You need, you need to shake the Chargers up a little. You kicking a 50-yard field goal is not shaking them up. Uh, so I, I thought that, so, you know, to, to parlay that discussion now into the discussion about Joe, um, I have a, an alternate theory, you know, how at the end of, um, training day they have an alternate ending where, um, you know, somebody else kills Denzel Washington or something. I have an alternate theory about Joe. I don't think Joe wanted to go in, is my theory. I think Joe said, what are, what, what are, what are the positives and the negatives from this? It's 12 nothing or 12 three. And if I go in there and some and these guys are going, those Bosa guys going nuts. And these guys are coming at us with their ears, ears, them. ears pinned back. I don't. I can't. Get, I can't afford to get hurt. I'm gone. I'm done. I know I'm done. I cannot afford to get hurt and then be peddling myself to these teams in February and March off of an injury. Um, I know that sounds selfish and it sounds a little sort of counter team, um, but you know, you got It's business, right? It is. Business. We are always are reminded it's business. And business, if you're Joe's agent, you would say to Joe on Sunday morning, by the way, do not get yourself in a situation where you've got to go in there and play. Well, you've run an organization, a sports organization before. When that's all going on, you know, you've heard the rumors about how Ray Lewis was in Steve Bashotti's box and he's saying we got to go with Flacco. And I think that was corroborated by Gary Williams in some mm-hmm. interview with Tony mm-hmm. Kornheiser. So those things are going on. Do you think there's conversation going on at halftime, between John and Steve, about whether um, to play Joe or not. No, no, no. I would never. I, I would be stunned if it got to that level where Steve is somehow communicating with John. I'm thinking the other way around. John communicates oh, with him. Yeah. Um, mm, no, I, I, no. I think John. You know, the interesting question around town is: Has John been mandated to play Lamar? Like, that's the interesting question, right? You know, was John mandated to play Lamar? Um, I think they went into it. I think it was sort of organic. I think they went into it when Joe got hurt, and they said, look, I mean, again, they're, they're, some of the things, this is some of it's rocket science, some of it's not. What wasn't rocket science was they were playing two terrible teams. We'll just use Lamar for these two games, and we'll squeeze two wins out somehow. We might only win 14-6, to six, but we'll win. And then Joe will be ready for Atlanta, and... Well, Joe will be back in, right? I think organically that's the way they wanted it to grow. Then when 
they started running for 275 yards for two games in a row. And Joe was sort of kind of still. My hip mm, feels okay. I'm ready to go. But, you know, maybe I could use another week. I think it just festered into this, man, this is really working out well for us, right? And they couldn't really go back to Joe at that point. Um, but to Sunday, they needed it. It's, 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 it's the relief pitcher thing, right? It's the, the starter just doesn't have it today. He like didn't, but... Scherzer, 34 starts a year. 32 of them, he is balls on, right? His money, yeah. There's a start in the middle of May, and there's a start in late August where he goes two and a third, and he's like, dude, I don't know. I don't have it. And you just go ahead and you get it. Well, and I thought that's what they should have done. I, I, I'm not saying Joe would have come back and won the game. Was he rusty? Sure. He had not played in six weeks? Yes. All that. I get it. I, I would have gone to him at that point. And brought him in. Well, I want to ask you something that might have repercussions off the field and in the locker room in a second. But I want to talk about on the field first with Joe Flacco. The team he struggles the most against consistently is the Cincinnati the Bengals. Bengals. Right. And the reason he struggles against those guys is because they play zone in the back and they get after him with four guys. Mm -hmm. The Chargers were doing exactly that with seven DBs. Right. So for that reason, right. I don't think Joe does anything better than Lamar. A, a fair point. And the only counter to that, that we'll do point, counterpoint, counter, counterpoint. Right? Okay. And then you could do counter, counter, counterpoint. Okay. But the only, <laughs> then I'll do it now. Okay. A double dog so, there you go on your right. counterpoint. <laughs> so the only thing I would say to that is that I think if Joe would have come in, there would be a chance, not saying it would have happened, because I don't know what the Chargers playbook looked like, there would have been a chance that their configuration might have changed a little. Perhaps. Giving him a little more respect over the top than they would have given Lamar. That I don't think they were concerned at all about Lamar throwing the deep ball. Whereas with Joe and Brown, you got to be a little more. They might have, they might have moved one guy deeper out of that box of seven. They might have moved one guy back. It might have changed a little. But on the whole, I would agree with you that Hey, they're, they're, they're using, you know, the cover two has always been Joe's. The Bengals thing has always been Joe's Achilles heel, right? And they were kind of doing the same thing. Um, and it may, might not have worked. But again, you don't know that the relief pitcher is going to work either when you bring him in. You just know Scherzer can't throw a You don't. But now right. this gets to the second part of my question or, or comment. You've got Lamar. He's pulled. Now, those guys, to a man, you could almost say, they believe that without the change, the Ravens would not have made the playoffs without Lamar. Mm -hmm. Now, they're they're 100% behind him. You got Jimmy Smith yelling at the fans because the fans are booing for Joe Flacco. Right. So, obviously, there's a commitment right. to yeah. Lamar. So, if they go to Joe and it doesn't work, knowing what you know about running sports organizations, right. is there a little fluttering in the locker room that becomes damaging going forward? Maybe. I mean, always comes back. Look, I, I always say this. Tell this to anybody I ever talk about sports to and coaches. And I, um, you know, I have friends that I talk to all the time that, run, that are soccer coaches and basketball and we golf and we talk all the time about coaching. Nothing good ever comes from losing. Never. When you lose, parents get mad, kids get mad on the team. When you're losing at the pro ranks, the owner gets mad, the fans get mad, we're not going to the game. Like nothing good comes from losing. So to your point, you know, yeah, if they go to Joe and they still lose 23 to 10, people, you know, players might have said, hey, you know, I mean, John, I don't think John was coaching for his job on Sunday at all. In fact, probably looks like it was the opposite based on some of the moves he made. Um, but, you know, you, you're, you do risk some unrest for sure. I, I, I would be interested to know in the locker room, though, how many of the guys, if they would put their coaching hat on, take their player hat off, put their coaching hat on, which isn't easy to do, when you're a player, wouldn't have also seen this just wasn't happening for him. He just was, you know, I say in over his head, but I don't, I'm not trying to say that to demean it. It was, the, it was just too much too soon. Um, first playoff game at home might have been not a good thing for the Ravens to be at home, right? Like, you know, all these little things that you can't change, right. but he was just kind of in over his head. Well, let's, let's look at that fourth quarter. They make a comeback. It's 23-17. They have the ball. What was it, 55 seconds yeah, ago? Well, 35 when he fumbled, right, or 40. But okay, yeah, because okay. he threw one pass. Right. So now there's a chance. Unbelievable, right? Yeah. The throw he made across the middle where he was sacked three times and just threw it up for grabs. It was a complete throw up for grabs, right? It went over and, Derwin and James it, you know, it was the, You know what it was reminiscent of? It was reminiscent of the ball last year that went over Mosley's head. 
Yes. If you watch the replay, the ball misses Thurman James's fingers by this yes. much. It's, it was unbelievable. Um, changed the whole complexion. It takes of the, like he was running in quicksand it was, when he got it was the crazy. ball. Right, but it changed the whole complexion of the of the of that last four minutes. Right, because if you remember, they had a chance to assault the game away, and the, they had the again another John thing. The onside kick was crazy. I don't know why you would have even thought about doing that to me. At that point. It was crazy. I would right. have flipped him around. No, no doubt. Right. Kicked the ball off to him and defend. Right. And, and, and to his credit, he did do it right the second time around. Um, Tucker, I didn't know this. You know, Tucker's never had a successful onside kick. Oh, for 12. That's crazy. It is. That's a crazy stat for a guy. I mean, he's not very good at it. Like, uber talented. Right. Right. And it's so much a fluke the way the ball bounces, right? I mean, the first one he did just went right to Keenan Allen's hand. Right. So it was perfect. But, um, you know, they had the, the run outside where Okun got called for holding, or the game was over, right? The game was done. Yes. Um, but just the way the Chargers kind of sloughed off the old prevent defense, and you know what that does, prevents you from winning. So my dad always used to say, yes. <laughs> whenever the, Chuck Thompson would go, oh, the calls are in a prevent, my dad's like, well, you know what this is going to mean. We're, lo- <laughs> we're losing. We're losing. <laughs> right. Um, so I, it was, a, I was standing up at the end, like, thinking, these guys might come back and win. There's a, apt, there's a flag coming at some point, right? These refs are apt to throw a flag here at some point coming up. We're going to throw the ball down the 24-yard line, get a flag, throw it to the seven, and we're going to win. Like, I thought they were winning at the end. And it would have been almost comical to win, right? I mean, Right, because six minutes into the fourth quarter, they got 51 net yards. Right, it's crazy. Right. It was nuts. So, um, I, you know, lots of little... Lots of little things. We could sit here for hours and talk about the decisions and the everything and just the game planning. And it just, it was just one of the, it was a crazy day. It would, they, you would have never thought, I mean, look, as I said, they're due for a stinker, right? Not that, not that. That wasn't, that was, that, that was, was beyond stinker. Well, oh my gosh. That was, can't get it out of the room for an hour kind of stinker. That was the, the Dundalk silos. That's, Man, that's what kind of I never would have thought. Was. I mean, the Chargers are good. And I, I, I you got to tip your hat to them, you know. Rivers, for as sort of dislikable as he is, when you're on the other side, and his juvenile kind of bratty behavior, he is a he's a fighter, man. And you, I watched him on the sidelines, work the sidelines. This this is the one thing I would say about Joe. I can't even believe we're going to do this. This is like the now we're now it's time for the you know for the autopsy, right? This is the one thing I would say about Joe, like. I know it's not in his personality. I get it. I've worked with Joe. I ghost wrote a blog for him for two years. I know him. It's not in his personality to go up and grab you and get in your face. But I think that's what makes Rivers really good. And I think that that's what the players, I think when you're mature enough, like he and Keenan Allen got into it the other day two or three times. But he, he would throw the ball right back to him again. And when Allen called it, he'd be the first one there hugging him. Like, there's, you've got to have that relationship and you've got to be able to confront people and encourage and argue and fight and bite and still win right and that's the one thing rivers does i, I i'm i'm a really I'm a fan of his and i think he is an, a limited you know he's got an odd throwing motion he's kind of a limited guy who gets so much out of his ability it's and, amazing and when you look at that team you're right they are a really good team but the Ravens held them to 243 yards of offense despite really bad field position most of the game. I mean, there were four drives. Well, it was just like our game out there, right? It could have been, it was almost could the have flip been 20 side. nothing yeah. right away. Like, yeah. we fumbled the ball. They could have gone in. They didn't. We did the same thing out there, right? We picked off the first play of the game, could have gone down and scored, got a field goal. You know, like, same things, all those same things happened. Right. It was like the same. It was a mirror image. But 243, 198 last time, that's the worst two offensive outputs from the Chargers in 2018. Right. That's one of the reasons why I kind of sort of think they might win these next two games. I, they're not going to see a defense that, again that can do That's this That's got to be them. a ball buster to go from Baltimore back to L.A., back to New England. Right. You know, within a week, right. that's, that's going to be a right. ball buster. Um, I like them, though. I, I have a f- – I, you know, I'm not saying this because I picked them in the beginning of the year because I did, but I also picked Minnesota. So I had to sort of win in the Super Bowl with the Chargers. Um, I just like them this weekend. I – I don't think they're going to see – this will be a breath of fresh air for them. It will be a relief to play against the New England defense after what they had to go through. No doubt. Um, and they just have a lot of – you know, Gordon was nicked up a little bit, but the other kid came in and did a nice job. Um, they just 
you know, there are some times it was like the Capitals last year, right? Last June. It was just their time. You know, they had been there. They got close. They got beat. They had a lot of wounds to lick over the years. The Chargers, they're due. This is kind of their, wouldn't surprise me at all if they won. All thing. Just sort of feels like it might be their time. Might be right. It would be kind of interesting to see Rivers go up against Drew Brees, his old teammate, yeah, in the Super Bowl. Absolutely. Right. That'd be a lot right. of fun. Um I, I do like them this weekend. I think Kansas City will beat Indianapolis, but I you know, wouldn't be shocked to see the Colts win, but I think it'll be close. I think Kansas City wins. And then it's San Diego, Kansas City, which would be a pretty good final, right? For the AFC. Absolutely. Yeah. Why don't we take a quick break? When we come back, let's talk a little bit about MVPs for the Ravens, a recap of the season, and some of the things we observed through 2018. Don't go away. This is the primary mortgage armchair quarterback. Residential. (laughs) Why PMI? I get asked that question all the time, and I love answering it. I've been leading this team for 16 years, and PMI has been and remains an industry leader. We get all the support of an industry leader national company while managing our loan flow locally. Our realtor partners and our customers get a team committed to customer service. They also get a team that knows our local markets. We closed 2,300 loans last year and the future looks very, very bright. We love telling our story and would love to help you with your next transaction. Reach out to me or anyone on my team anytime. We'd love to help. Welcome back to Primary Residential Mortgage Armchair Quarterback. Tony Lombardi here with Drew Forrester. We were talking about the Ravens and Chargers before the break, and we're going to get into some of the post-mortem, Drew, with uh, the MVP, you know, surprise. the buses all planned. We were staying in Providence at the Embassy Suites. We were all ready to go. Half the people were signed up. Uh, more just I, waiting. I had a lot of people signed up, you know, just reserving spots, and I'm watching the game. It's like betting on the game. It's like betting on the game when you do something like this and you have this all planned out. It's like betting on the game. You know, you're just watching, and you're like, "Well, I'm not winning this bet." <laughs> do you do you have to commit any any dollars to make this happen? That, that, no, no, that you forfeit. No, 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 no. Okay, no. But you know, it's just there's there is definitely a piece of you that's that, that doesn't like doing it because you know it's tempting the sports gods, right? You're like, I'm going to organize this whole thing, right? And these guys are not going to come through for me, and then I'm going to be holding two buses and two. And 30 hotel rooms and 30 tickets. You know, you're nervous, right? So I that think that so many people wanted to see the Ravens play the, uh, the, uh, no the Patriots. It would have been a great trip. Yeah. It would have been an epic game to go up there against them. More than anything, right? They're, they've become, I mean, I know the fancy thing is like the Steelers-Ravens thing. But I, I feel like over the years, that's, for whatever reason, maybe after Ray left, it's kind of been watered down. But And we get the Patriots next year. Ravens-Patriots is the game to me. Like, if we could play them every year, you know, that would be cool. So you like that better? Well, we play the Steelers twice a year. But that's, right. That's... I, but I feel like that's – I just feel like the Ravens-Steelers thing has lost a little bit of its luster. Maybe it's because in the big games over the last four or five years, they beat us all the time when the games really matter, other than when we went up there in – what was it? 14. 14. Whatever, beat them in the playoffs. Um, I don't know. I just – the that Patriots game would have been a circle your calendar and, you know, not a Brett Kavanaugh circle your calendar. I mean, like a real, like a real circle of your calendar. I worked a Brett Kavanaugh reference in here. You got to give me. He some did. <laughs> okay, so I don't, we haven't even thought about him in eight weeks. I guess. <laughs> Let's talk about the season in its totality. You know, and t- looking back, just surprises, disappointments, most valuable player, just the season on its whole. You know, did it play out the way you thought it might? In the end, I know the the path they took right. was different. It was but weird, right? Well, I said they would finish eleven and five and win the division. I guess if Crabtree catches that ball in Cleveland, they I would have been eleven right and five. That was spot on. Um, but I didn't think it would happen this way. Um, you know, MVP is kind of weird because they it was a team sort of void of any real great players. Humphrey had a really really good season. Yes, he did. Um, Pierce had a an unbelievable season. Um, if you said to me who was the most valuable player, uh, now that it's all, you know, put, the books are all on the shelf, I might say Lamar Jackson. I, I would too. <laughs> like, the, he changed the season. He did. Um, it, it, he changed the season because he was so different. I, I, you know, he wasn't great. He didn't play great. He just, he was so different, and teams just didn't really know how to confront him and contain him. Um that he, he, you know, he changed the season. Through pure athleticism, 
he made everybody on that team better. His offensive line he made better. No doubt. His running backs he made better. No I'm not so much no sure run, about the receivers, 100%. but the, the defense was better. They were off the field more. So No, I, no doubt. So for that reason, I, I would give him the MVP I, too. I, I think the best player on the team for the season was Pierce to me. I don't know about the fancy grades from Pro Football Focus and all that. Your guy that does your web, website Kevin is outstanding. Cusick. Right. I mean, I, I don't know what they how their grades came out. To my untrained eye, I thought Pierce had the best season. Humphrey was really, really good. I think Mosley had a good year. I, I know he gets a lot of grief about his playing coverage, and you know he's he's not great in coverage. I don't think he's as terrible in coverage as everybody gives him. But I tell you, he's developed into a really good run stopper. He sees the field well. He's going to get paid. I don't think the Ravens are giving him fifteen million, uh, and I wouldn't. Frankly, I probably wouldn't keep him. But um, you know, I think he's developed into a good player. To me, I think he's been getting some. Uh, he's been getting maybe more grief than he deserves. To me. I think that's because the safeties don't do a great job of covering anymore. Maybe there's some deficiencies there that you kind of spread the blame, and he's part of the, the spread. I mean, he's not great in coverage. There's no doubt. No. But I got news for you: there aren't a lot of linebackers in the league who are great. In coverage. It's a it's a problem throughout it's one of the, the league. Reasons why they're a linebacker? They're heavier and they're not as quick as safeties. They'd right. be a safety. So you have to ask yourself, is this a position of impact that you're willing to spend $15 million per year of your cap money to, to have a, a, one of the better players there? And I think you have to look at, well, who comes up next? You know, Peanut and Wasso really Terrific. came on strong. Terrific. Kenny Young was good. And Kenny Young, he's a developing see, player. Right. We're just seeing the beginning stages. Um, you know, does he have the pedigree and the DNA of Mosley coming out of school? Obviously, he doesn't. Yeah. But he, he acquitted himself well when he was in there. I'm almost of the mindset, Tony. I, I think you and I talked about this before. I'm almost of the mindset now that unless the guy is an extraordinary talent, you get them through their first five or six year deal after you've drafted them, and then you just let them go. I agree with, and, with and, all and, positions. And you just, correct. And you just keep retooling. And unless they're extraordinary, right? And. That would be, of course, the argument about Joe, right? We'd always go back to Joe. Joe will be this generation's Ernest Biner when it comes to the Ring of Honor. Joe will be, you know, should have never given Joe all that money. And, the, and of course, the answer to that is he just won you the Super Bowl. You had to give him the money. They painted right? themselves in the corner right. there. But um, I, I, I'm almost now of the mindset that if I ran a football team, I would, I would almost just tell you from Jump Street, like, we love you. You're going to be with us for six years. And don't buy a house from, you know, don't. Don't worry about the seventh year because you're going to be somewhere else, unless you're extraordinary. And then I would fill that in by saying, I don't think Mosley's extraordinary. I think he's a good player. And and this had some really in good games and impactful moments, but I wouldn't give him $15 million. And I, frankly, I don't know anybody on the team I'd give that kind of money to right now with maybe the one guy that looks like he could be a real upper echelon dynamic talent is Humphrey. I agree. And even then, he got lit up by the Browns. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, he he, even then, he has a, he's Scherzer. He had a bad game that day, right? Um, Biggest disappointment this year for you? Well, I said this at the beginning. You know, I said this. I think we did this at the halfway point. Mine hasn't changed. My biggest disappointment is that they um, – that they that, how do I say this the right way? You know, that my biggest disappointment is that they fiddled around in the first round and wound up with – tight end who barely made an impact. Um, picked a guy in the third round who turned out to be a, a really positive contributor in Andrews. Um, at the time when we did that at the halfway point, Jackson hadn't played at all. But he turned out to be of value. Mm -hmm. Hurst had very little value. And so I just wonder if reconfigured, could they have taken Derwin James? And still been able to work their way into a deal for Jackson somehow, some way. Um, so that's, I guess, an easy or short way or long way, maybe, of saying the biggest disappointment to me would be Hurst. That as a first round pick, you got pretty much nothing out of him. I mean, pretty much. You've got to, I think the one ar unarguable thing we would say about these first round picks is they've got to hit. They've got to hit. They do. And that's, so far, it's a miss. Now, tight ends sometimes right, right. take a little time to develop, but, but I would agree with you that if you, if you didn't know the better, you would say Andrews was the first round pick and Hurst was the third. And by the way, Hurst will be 27 this year, right. not 23. Right. Not 24. Right. So, so his, you know, if, if you believe in that tread on the tire thing, 
just by uh, the nature of his body. He's uh, he's got more tread off of his tires than he's ever got. So I would say I would say you know that other than losing a home playoff game, which to me is really is disappointing, I would say Hurst. And we haven't even talked about this, but I had the same one that it was going to be Hayden Hurst instead of uh, Derwin James. But right. since I, I don't want to copy, I'll say that my second biggest disappointment was when they signed James Hurst to a deal, they signed him to have a quality swing guy. Mm-hmm. He wasn't supposed to be a starter. The guy that was supposed to be the starter was Alex Lewis. And that guy this year compared to, what was it, two years ago he was drafted? Mm-hmm. Nothing like that player. Not that nasty, mean-spirited guy that, you know, you might be like a guard version of Ryan Jensen. Big disappointment. I think that changed the configuration of what they wanted to do in the interior line this well, year. Well, and moving forward, too, they're going to have to make a decision about how they want to, how they want to attack their line from the athleticism standpoint. Uh, they're going definitely to, they're going, they're going more need, nimble guards. Right. They're going to need some faster guys, um, which, which then might mean smaller, right, because they did kind of go hand-in-hand. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that needs to be reworked, and I think they've got a little bit of a challenge moving forward with regard to being able to recruit receivers to come in and play in this offense if they can't prove that Lamar can throw. And I, I, I say can throw, I don't. By no means do I mean he can't throw. You know what I'm saying? If it, if it proves out that Lamar isn't a pocket passer that will can and will throw the ball 30 or 35 times a game successfully, I think they're gonna have a hard time bringing receivers in. And so to go back to your disappointment thing, maybe I would just pile on a little bit to say, I think that those three guys were okay this year. Not much better. Than that. Those three guys are just kind of complimentary guys. John Brown, flashes, fast, good hands. Um, was okay, right? Crabtree, eh. You can see why he was available, right? He was okay. Nothing more. It's almost um, just a guy now. Correct. He is just a guy. Um, and um, other ones slipping my mind, right? Sneed. A, a Sneed. And Sneed, same thing, right? No, he's okay. Nothing great. Good. But they, they need better than that. And, and um, you know, again, uh, how you go get those guys is why they give Eric all that money and not me or you. But they got to go get better receivers, um, either through the draft, which is never – don't even want to go there. It's never never been our, our uh, you know – in, in our favor, um, they need better receivers, and I, I'm not sure how you're going to go get better receivers. It's like the, you know, it's like trying what the Orioles try to do with Alex Cobb. It's like bringing a fly ball pitcher into Baltimore. They don't work that way. Reminds me of Demarius Thomas when he was at Georgia Tech, you know, and they were they were running a similar offense to what the Ravens run right now. Mm-hmm. So he ended up being a pretty good pro. But you're right; it's going to be difficult to bring in a veteran, high price free agent because they're going to look at unless they overpay. Right. They're not well, going to come. It's like the old days with Bowler, right? Nobody would come. I mean, those guys around the league, the free agents around the league, are like huh? Terrell Owens. Go have him throw the ball to me? No, I'm good, right? I mean, it, 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 you know, again, it's the business, right? When your agent sits down with you and says, "We got four teams interested. We got the Falcons, we got the Ravens, we got the Rams, and we got the Eagles." You know, well, Falcons, I'm going to be the number two or three guy because Julio's there and Sanu's there and Ridley's there, but I can throw. I know I'm going to get the ball. Man. Rams, boy, I know I can get some balls there. And if Cooper Cup doesn't come back, I might be able to play. Eagles, I, you know, there's two guys there that can throw the ball. Ravens, yeah, I don't know. So I don't know if you're a receiver business-wise. All right. The Ravens don't make much sense. Because you don't build your resume statistically, and that's what people right. look at a lot 100%. going forward. TDs and how many catches you get. And even then, there's no guarantee. Look at this one. Uh, lunatic up in Pittsburgh, right. right? I mean that you know you you have there. It's there are necessary evil wide receivers are the most eclectic, um, mercurial group of you know departmentally. They're the oddest group of people in football. Like even when you get the ball thrown to you, you're still not happy because you, you don't want it thrown to him, right? Because you're. Throwing- I mean, there's no question in Pittsburgh the whole thing fell apart over Schuster Smith. That Brown just can't stand having seeing that kid have even a modicum of success because he's getting double teamed. Well, I'm the one getting double teamed, and he's catching balls, and he's the MVP. Right? Right. But we're seven, two, and one. I don't care about that. I got to have the ball for like that. That's their mentality. There are divas, and, and there right. are Antonio Browns. Right. I mean, he might be the exception to the rule 
at the magnitude of that, but um, for the most part, the, all the great ones are kind of sort of the same way. Like it's got to it's got to come to me. We'll let the other guys catch a couple balls late in the game, but I need all of the big ones thrown to me. What about your biggest pleasant or your most pleasant surprise on the team? Um, well, Peanut was really good. You know, I thought he had a terrific season. Um, Andrews, you know, I don't, I don't want to say Andrews was a surprise because I think when you look at him, you, he reminds you a little bit of Pitt and Heat, right? He just not just because he's a big white punnet, but he just looks the part, right? Um, he looks even bigger than those guys. Yeah, he's, he does. He almost looks like he's almost Gronk a little bit. Yeah, he does look a little bit like Gronk. Um, I would say, you know, Peanut definitely a, a pleasant surprise. Um, Judon had a really, really good year. He's going to make a lot of money because he's, you know, he's going to be a twelve or fourteen sack guy, and there, those guys are going to cash in. Right? Mm -hmm. He's going to make a lot of money. Um, so, I, you know, I would say that those two guys really stood out. I thought they were. They both had really good years. They, they did. And until the other day, I thought Orlando Brown had done well. I mean, he really got exposed on Sunday. But kind of everybody did. They all did. But Brown, I thought Brown was a pleasant surprise, too. But when you look back, you know, this, by the way, this draft class could be really good. If you think about it. I agree. They like the Everett kid from, um, Everett from uh, Alabama. Alabama. Um, Kenny Young. Um, obviously, Andrews is we think going to blossom into something very good. Jackson. Uh, Jerry's out, obviously, on Hurst. Um, the kid that got hurt, the Elliott kid from Texas. Yes. They really liked him in training Safety. camp. Safety, yeah. Um, Deshaun Elliott. So, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think they, this is, this could be the beginning of a little bit of a resurgence with the draft. And maybe but Bozeman's a serviceable back, backup for, for a couple of years. Oh, Bozeman. Right. So, right. They, they, they played him the other day, even yeah. when uh, Hurst was getting clobbered. Of course. Um, but if you look back over the last couple of years, you know, Tim Williams, ugh, not so much right now, right? Um, yeah, that's I mean, that's just a go, disappointment right there, too, the way the way names, started. Right? I mean, we could go through the names of these guys. Bowser. Like Bowser, non-existent. Um, Williams, nothing. The kid that they let go, Kafusi, zero. Like, you know, they had a couple, 15, 16s were 15, 16 drafts. I mean, not talking about the Humphrey, not the first big guys, but the but the back of the back of the rack guys. Ooh, boy, that's not going well. Yeah. For me, last year, uh, last, this past draft could turn out to be very fruitful for them. I agree. For me, my biggest pleasant surprise was Carr, Brandon Carr. Because I thought coming into the season, he was a liability last year. Mm -hmm. And he I don't know if he was hurt and just played through it because he's one thing you can always say about him, he's dependable. He plays every game. But I just thought he played really well this year, a lot of nickel situations. But he contributed. Even that interception to start the game against Rivers was a great play. Mm -hmm. And I thought this was a guy that was a hands down cut after this year. Now I'm not so sure. Right. Where, are you, where are you going to get a good corner for six million? Right. You know, I um and to talk to about that too, real quick. You know, it would make the Jimmy Smith uh, departure a little more reasonable, right? If you could count on Carr, maybe you have to draft another cornerback. I mean, Averett they liked, but maybe you've got to draft one in the second round. And Humphrey at this point now is ready. He'll be in his third year. He's ready to be the the man, right? So Smith seems like, unless he's willing to take a significant pay cut, he seems like he'd be the odd guy out. And you could plug Carr in there for a little while. Right. You could draft draft someone. You could go sign someone. Um, other pleasant surprise, nothing to do with the team on the football field, having um, been there a number of times this year. Um, the this reduction in the concession prices by the Ravens was really turned out to be, to me, as someone who goes with their son and, you know, Lord, I don't know where all the food goes that he eats. He's not, or 12, but, you know, he eats like he's 30. Um, is walk, walking up and buying food and giving them a $20 bill and you have enough food for the two of you and you get change back. Like, that never used to happen. Right. You know, chicken tenders, $14. Beer, Twelve, you know, soda eight, you know, it was obscene almost, right? Um, I think the Ravens went out of their way this year, and and so that anyone doesn't think I'm discounting what the Orioles have done, I think the Orioles have really tried over the last few years to um, enhance your um, experience at the stadium. I think the Ravens have really tried hard to enhance your experience, 
little things like the escalators and those video boards and um, the food prices, you know, that costs them money this year. So that, I don't know if you want to follow it under a pleasant surprise or just an attaboy, but I think they deserve some credit for what I saw of an attempt to make your viewing experience or your attendance experience more pleasant. Obviously, they have some attendance issues, but you know, I think they're trying. Great. They, one thing I can say for sure about the Ravens having had this conversation with people who work there, they are very, very aware of the attendance issues and very, very concerned. They're, they're not oblivious. No, they're, they're not ignoring A plus for effort all throughout right. the year. Right. And in the community, the things that they do, it's amazing. And I don't think they get enough credit for that. Because right. right. it's just like, you know, you look, turn on the local news, what do they talk about? Bad news. Mm-hmm. Bad things happen on the field. They talk about that, but they don't talk about the right. good things the Ravens do in the community, and they do a lot of good things. Right. So let's take a short break. When we come back. I want to talk a little bit about the new regime and the challenges that lie ahead for the Ravens. Don't go away. This is a primary residential mortgage armchair quarterback. Why PMI? I get asked that question all the time, and I love answering it. I've been leading this team for 16 years, and PMI has been and remains an industry leader. We get all the support of an industry leader, national company, while managing our loan flow locally. Our realtor partners and our customers get a team committed to customer service. They also get a team that knows our local markets. We closed 2,300 loans last year and the future looks very, very bright. We love telling our story and would love to help you with your next transaction. Reach out to me or anyone on my team anytime. We'd love to help. And welcome back into the Primary Residential Mortgage Armchair Quarterback. Before we went to the break, we started talking about the new regime, Drew. There's a lot of changes ahead. Eric DaCosta comes on board for Ozzie Newsom. Joe Flacco is moving on to Lamar Jackson's team. And then there's a lot of other key veterans that there's some question marks. So let's start with those guys. And, and the three that really jump off the page of me are all on defense. Eric Weddle, C.J. Mosley, and Terrell Suggs. Well, you know, the, the, all three of them, they do kind of different things now, right? Mosley's still a really high-level player. Um, Suggs can have a high-level moment, but for the most part, he's in the December of his career. Uh, and the same for Weddle. He's kind of been um, maligned here a little bit, I think, over the last couple of years. Um, he's a good player. I, mm, probably not much more than that now, right? Um, I think that he really, really likes it here, though. And I, I, I have a funny feeling Weddle's going to stay. I think, he, I think they'll keep him one more year. I mean, keep it meaning, you know, they'll fulfill the last year of his deal. I don't see them giving Mosley the kind of money you're going to need to give him to get it. Um, I think someone with a lot of money, like the Colts or the Browns, will come in and give him 19, you know, give him his 35 million up front. And, you know, I guess the middle linebacker thing now is 15 or 16 million a year. He'll, he'll, he'll get a 75 or 80 million dollar deal somewhere. You know, for five years. This is his one big contract, right? And he's not a Luke Keekley. I mean, he's good, but he's not a Keekley. Yeah, right. I mean, but I think somebody will give him a lot of money. I think he's going to He'll get probably paid. get more than Keekley. He's going because... to get paid. And I think it's over for Terrell. I, I think he's going to play. He's going to look to try to get the Ed Reed contract from somebody one time. Would not surprise me at all to see him go to the Cardinals. I've been saying that over and over. So you, you don't think fit. that having – he's got a relationship with Ed Reed – Having that conversation with Ed, if you could go back and do it again, would you remain a Raven? Now, he said publicly he wants to remain a Raven, but that could be positioning and, and you know, just trying to create right. some kind of leverage. I think in in this case, well, and in Ed's case, and in, the, and in Sug's case, I think it always is going to come to money. It's just, this is it. You know, I, 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 if he has a conversation with Reed, Reed's going to say, let me tell you what to do. Go get the money. You're still going to be a Raven for life. You're still going to come back here, and you're never going to have to pay for a dinner at Jimmy Seafood. You're still going to get in the Ring of Honor. You're still going to, you're going to be a Raven forever. You're nothing you can nothing you can do now will change that, right? Um, unless you go to the Steelers or something stupid. I don't know. I mean, even that right. probably wouldn't change it. But you know, I think Reed would say if you can get ten million from somebody, go get ten million from somebody. Um, and I just kind of feel like. That's sort of the that you know I don't even want to say that's the way he's built to make it sound like he's selfish. I think that's the way the players are built. They're built that if the Ravens are going to give you four million and some other team's going to give you ten, go get ten, right? Especially when you're going to be thirty-seven next year. Yeah, I mean, like I said, he's in the December of his career. He's on the you know sixteenth green of his career. 
he doesn't have much left. Been a great player for the Ravens. Absolutely, I think so, he's going to be a Hall of Famer. My I agree. opinion of him. I don't want to say my opinion of him has changed because I always thought he was a, a great player, a game changing player. But you know, three years ago, when someone says son's a Hall of Famer, I said not yet. But if he has three more good years, you know, yeah, sure, he'll be a Hall of Famer. He's had enough. He's put enough money in the bank now. I'm saying that you know, money in the bank is a description. Um, he's done enough now to be a Hall of Famer. He's going to be a Hall of Famer. I don't think he's going to be a Hall of Famer. He's not going to be a first ballot guy. He'll get in the room. He'll be in the room for four or five years and then get in. He's going to get in. So back to your point with uh, Eric Weddle. If you're going to lose Mosley, you're going to lose Suggs. It's a lot of leadership to lose those two guys. Right. If you lost Weddle in addition to that, that's two of the green dot guys. Now, from an organizational perspective, I know there's a lot of leadership there that's lost. How do you make up for that? Well, good, good, you know, good point. I, I look to me, I look at Humphrey as a guy who, um, it, this is a very interesting, subtle thing, like that doesn't have anything to do with anything, but I notice these things. He's the only guy on the team that I saw that when he runs out of the tunnel, he doesn't do anything except run in a at, at the regular speed, right to the guys holding his hands out, and he just comes out. Like that to me, that's a I'm I'm here for business and football. And I'm I don't have to point to the sky, I don't have to raise fire, I don't have to do it. That dance. is pretty cool to raise a fire though. It I do like when cool. Suggs does it, that. It, it is pretty cool. Is pretty, <laughs> Ethan's like my son's like, how does he do that? <laughs> it's like in the old days with the blast when the spaceship used to come down and the players would run through. Can't tell you how many of my friends would say, dude, how do you get sixteen of those guys in that little spaceship? And that broke my heart to say. Well, actually, it's a door. It opens, and the players aren't really in the spaceship. They were, it was like Santa Claus, right? It really hurt me to tell them there is. The guys aren't in the spaceship. They're not up in the roof. Come on. Anyway, man. anyway, sorry if I sorry if I just let out a trade secret of the blast uh, from 1982. But um, I love that about Humphrey. I love it. They introduce Marlon Humphrey. He just runs out of the tunnel. He doesn't wave. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't dance like Kevin Bacon. He just comes out and goes and plays football. I, I, so you know when you say like <laughs> when you say who's who, who's the leader, which is a very fair question. Um, I think he's a leader, hundred percent. I, I I think he's a leader. Um, and you know, so there you got Weddle, you got him. Uh, I, I I don't know enough about Jefferson. the inner circle. I, I don't know enough of the inner circle to say is Brandon Williams a leader or or Pierce or any of those guys, um, Judon. But those two strike me as the guys for sure. Now, changing the guard with the, the new regime coming on with Eric DaCosta, knowing Eric the way you do, knowing the way I know him, what do you expect to be different about the 2019 Ravens from a front office perspective? Um, that's a good question. I mean, obviously, the everybody sees players differently, right? I mean, it's just a name. Eric's been groomed by Ozzy, but Eric does have a little bit of a different eye. Um, my you know, brief sort of history with Eric is I think Eric is a playmaker guy. He, you know, he, I think that the Ravens will look for more playmakers than trench guys. That's just off the cuff guess. I, Eric hadn't told me that, but I just think that we'll be more active in trying to bring in wide receivers. You know, these days we would always say, well, you know, Ozzy, Ozzy doesn't bring in wide, free agent wide receivers. We just don't do that. Just not what the Ravens do. Like, I think Eric is of the mindset of playmakers, playmakers, playmakers. Um, Ozzy used to have that famous saying, you know, touch the ball or touch the quarterback. Right. right. You know, that, that's a. He didn't live by that lately. No, though. he didn't. That's a hell of a saying. Like, that, because that's really what you need, right? Right. You, if, if the guy can touch the ball or go get the other team's quarterback, that's who you go get. And the offensive and defensive linemen, eh, just go get some big kid from Iowa and put him in there. He'll be fine. Like, that's. Kind of my goofy mentality, right? Just well, go not get really. Player. It's not goofy because right. 2007, who, who knew what Marshall Yonder was? Right. So, I, I, you know, I think Eric is a little bit more, his proclivity will be more towards getting playmakers. That's what I think you'll see. Next. Because their core competency for years has been to be able to find those trench guys. Right. You mentioned Michael Pierce earlier in the show. Right. He's out playing Brandon Williams. Right. He's undrafted free agent. Right. So, and Brandon Williams pulling down a hefty number. 
I, I, you know, funny, I don't know this again. I'm just as conjecture. I, I think if the role, if Eric would have had, because Eric did have input in the draft last year. There's no question about that. But if the draft were Eric's signature on the bottom of the page in totality, the, I, my guess is they don't take Hurst. Now, would they have traded up to get DJ Moore or maybe in that position they wouldn't have had to trade up, right? They could have just taken DJ Moore. Would they have taken DJ Moore or Ridley or Derwin James? Under Eric, you know, those three are all playmakers. Hayden Hurst is a tight end, but is he? would we really consider him a playmaker, right? I mean, he's a tight end. Those other three guys, you would consider them to be playmakers. I mean, James, everyone said, was like the most athletically gifted and football gifted guy in the draft. Some people said he should be, by all accounts, the number one pick if he were just going off of football player. I know when I talk to Eric, one of the things he always says is that the, one of the things he learns most from Ozzie is patience and not panicking. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're drafting or, or you're negotiating with a free agent, patience and not panicking. He said he, that's probably the biggest lesson he's learned from him. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what you'll get from Eric is someone that's going to take the best of Ozzie because you've been his right-hand guy mm -hmm. for, what, now 15 years? Mm -hmm. And I think he'll combine that with some analytics and more modern outlook and I've, I've been on record saying I think he could be the Theo Epstein of of the NFL. Mm -hmm. I think he's that good. I mean, Ozzie's still going to be there and still be around, and they'll still lean on him for some guidance. But Eric, will... that's, that's, you bring up a good point. Do you think he's in the in the in the war room, Ozzie? Um, and then if he is, how much different does it make things? I do think he will be. I think it would be odd for him to not be sitting there. Um, now, how much input, you know, I don't know. It's but, kind of clumsy, isn't it? But, um, yes and no. I mean, it, it. I think with his wisdom, if nothing else, he gives you the nod of approval. Like when you look over and you go, Oz, what do you think? I think we're going with the wide receiver from Georgia. He gives you that, it warms you, right? So, I, I, I don't know. I feel like he's your, he's your father. You kind of want him hanging around long enough for you to say, Dad, now you can go now. He's the tiebreaker. You, you can go now. Yeah, Dad, we don't need you now. But we needed you a little while ago, and you were fine. Right. You can leave now. I don't know. I, but I think he'll be around. I, I don't think they'll completely dismiss him. And, and what's he going to do? Like It was like when they interviewed Springsteen on 60 Minutes, and they said, well, you're 60 years old. Why do you do this? So he was like, what the hell else is he going to do? Yeah. Right? Uh, what else is Ozzy going to do? This is it. This is what he does. It's football, right? But at some point, they had to turn. They had to turn it over to somebody else with new ideas and new energy. And I, I think the timing's right you know, with the new quarterback. And I guess John's coming. I mean, I don't say I guess John's coming back. John's coming back. But what could be a new identity with the team? And that new identity is going to include Lamar Jackson. It will not include Joe Flacco. When you think of Joe Flacco, you know, it's, it's kind of a sad time. You know, we, we've debated his skill level. We've debated some decisions he's made. And we've talked about the good things he's done versus the bad things. But in the end, it's been 11 years. It's been a real era that has brought for the first five seasons playoff football. You could argue that they could have won two Super Bowls in those first five years if, you know, there's not a guy named Lee Evans or a Billy Cundiff that comes around. But when you look at Joe... When you look back, what are some of the lasting impressions that you have of him? Oh, boy. Um, well, like I said earlier, nothing good ever comes from losing. And I think he got really unfairly criticized his last two or three years because they didn't make the playoffs. So Joe took the brunt of that. I think it's been sort of sad over the last maybe six weeks to see how much vitriol he's taking over um, what happened hip injury, got Wally pipped, in comes Lamar, and then Joe became, it, it, like a lot of things that are going on in our country now with the guy running it, it's you're either with him or against him. There is really no middle ground, right? And that's kind of the way it became with Joe. You Absolutely. either thought Joe was the answer and Lamar stunk, or Joe's done and Lamar's the only guy that can save us. And there wasn't really any middle ground. So one of the things that stands out to me is that I, I feel a little saddened about the way it ended for him because I feel like he did did enough to deserve a better going away gift than that. Um, good quarterback. I don't think he was 
you know, he had a great run in January of 2013 for sure. And one day, or you know, one game in 2000, uh, one game in February. Um, good quarterback. Just certainly, I mean, Testaverde's career was better than Joe's, but as a Ravens quarterback, Joe's the best quarterback we've ever had. Right? Without question. Yeah, I mean, he'll be in the Ring of Honor someday, I guess. As long as we keep having this debate about this, um, the rules of the of the Ring of Honor, the rule use debate that you have to get voted on for the Pro Bowl team to be considered. And he hasn't ever had that happen. So I think, though, that over time they've relaxed those rules a little bit. And I think Super Bowl MVP would qualify you instead of a Pro Bowl. Right. So I say he's going to be in the Ring of Honor unless somehow the rules don't permit it. I right? think he's a slam dunk. I, I do, too. But if the rule still somewhere says you got to be voted a Pro Bowl, then they're going to have to wiggle their way out of that somehow. However they do that. They'll say, well, well, MVP of Super Bowl trumps Pro Bowl, right? And it, and it should. <laughs> it absolutely <laughs> should. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think, uh, hey, look, Father Time, as they always say, right, he's undefeated. And um, he, he, he was a really, really important guy here. And you, who knows? In two years, you might be wishing he was still around. <laughs> you like, could. I mean, if you, you could. don't know what's going to happen with the kids in there now. And I think Joe will go somewhere and still be um, – He'll still be productive for a couple of years. If you could look in your crystal ball and say, could Lamar Jackson do what Joe Flacco did, you'd be real happy. Oh, boy. If he plays 11 years and they win a Super Bowl and they go to the AFC Championship three times, you'd be thrilled, right? Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we, we always sort of said that when Brian got fired and John took over, the, the saying then was, well, if Harbs is here nine years and wins the Super Bowl, we're going to be thrilled. He's been here 11 years, and he won a Super Bowl. We're, we should yeah. be thrilled, right? I mean, so you say the same thing. If Lamar could do what Joe's done, and again, this is where you get in that argument of, well, you know, Joe is, Joe stunk the last four or five years. He, 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 you know, again, the anti-Joe group right. will always have their say at the end because he wasn't all that good the last couple of years. But I still think he's got some productive football left. I think Let's, if he goes to the right franchise, he could still be, he can still help. Some, I think he's going to be great, but he can still help. Some great memories, though. The Mile High Miracle. No question. Super Bowl Forty Seven. And, you know, he see. had an interesting uh, personality, right? He's, um, I can still remember, I, I've, I've, I've told this story a lot, so it's not, I'm not breaking news. I may not have ever said it here, but, you know, the first year that he was on the team, it was a rookie season, we worked out a deal to, for me at the radio station, to ghost write a blog for so he, I would go out to training camp on Wednesday, or the, out to practice on Wednesday, and I would ask Joe some questions, and I would write it, and we would publish it every Friday. And um, at the very beginning when we did it, he would say to me, um, email it to me, and let me see what you write, just so I know what you wrote. I'm like, sure. Fair enough. Email it to him on Friday afternoon. We'd call him Friday night, I mean Thursday afternoon, and call him Thursday night. And say, Joe, you're good with it. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, thanks. And up it would go the next day. And it was all benign stuff. Like it, there was no, it, it was nothing in there at all, earth shattering. And and begin a training camp. He was just a kid they picked in the first round, right? So then all of a sudden he gets to play. He starts the first game, and and I'm like, he's not going to do this anymore. I mean, there's no way. Right? He's a starting quarterback on right. the team. I went out there on that Wednesday, and I'm like, uh, you still good with this? He's like, yeah. Oh, okay, so we did it. So after about the third week or so, he said, just tell you what, you don't have to do this. Just write it and just write whatever you want and just send it to me and let me see it. And I'd be like, okay. Saved you some time. Yeah, you know, I don't have to, even though I was coming out on Wednesdays, it, it, it just saved me going to the locker room, waiting for him to come out of the shower. You know, it just saved me time. Did that for two weeks. Then I called him, and he didn't answer on a Thursday night. Right? He didn't answer on a Friday. He didn't answer. He didn't answer. I'm like, oh, man, what do I do? Do I run it, not run it? What do I do? And I ran it. And the next Wednesday I went out, and I'm like, hey, I, I wasn't able to get a hold of you last Thursday night. He said, yeah, Mike and I, I think it was Mike. I think he said Mike. Mike and I went to the movies. Sorry I didn't get back to you. I didn't get back to you like 11 o'clock. I didn't want to call you, but it's all good. I, I went on and saw the next day. He said, look, you know, I'm just write it. Just 
don't stick it up my ass. I'm like, I'm not. I'll never do that. He's like, I know you wouldn't, but it's all good. You just write it yourself. So it took like seven weeks for Joe to, to go from, okay, now email it to me, and then I got to approve it. And then it went from that to, dude, just, just write it. You know, one of the things that's that, his personality. Right. right. I brought that up to just say, like, his personality was always like, eh, I don't care. Well, he, his body <laughs> language says that every time he's at the podium, right? Yeah. He, he he's only doing it because they told him he had to do it. Right. He's a very interesting, he, I, I, he reminds me so much of Mike Messina in this, um, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't say it exactly like that because Mike was a little bit more, um, almost arrogant about the fact that he didn't want to talk to you. Joe is more, I just don't feel like talking to you because it just doesn't interest me. Because the only thing that really interests me is playing football. So Joe just always came across to me like, me standing up here and talking to you people, it, it just doesn't get me going. I just want to play football. If there's a football game somewhere I want to play. Now, weren't you involved in the show, I guess it was a live broadcast somewhere, where he came out and said that he was elite. Yeah, it was at... I and that probably that. was a thing he'd like to take back more than anything he's ever said. It was at the old, on Perry Hall, on uh, Bel Air Road, at the old Bill Bateman's. Okay. Um, and Glenn and I, Glenn Clark and I were doing the show, and I remember Glenn and I saying, riding over, Glenn's like, we're going to get Joe to say he's elite. Joke. We're going to get Joe to say he's elite. Like, let's try to get Joe to say he's elite. And, and I said to Glenn, I'm like, dude, he's never he, he's just not like he's going to say that's for you to decide or or I'm not answering that or he might even get mad I even remember saying to Glenn like he might get pissed off about that like don't put him under the gun and Glenn's like he's fine he'll, he'll, we'll get him to do it right and um Glenn you know we're sitting there and Glenn said you you know Joe lots of talk lots of talk around football about this word they use the word the e word you know and I'm like yep here it comes Joe and he <laughs> sort of smiles and Glenn's like you you consider yourself elite? And he's like, yeah, I sure do. Like, and that one. And it's still on, like, the NFL Network Ravens Super Bowl film. I, I saw it's that. It's still yeah. on there. Like, this is Joe <laughs> saying, I'm elite. And you're right. Joe might. I don't think he would take it back because I think Joe thought, Joe thought he was elite. Right? That he whole story you just shared leading into that reminded me of the Code Red. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. It was kind of that. Right. I'm going to get him to say it. Right. When um, Debbie Moore's like, don't push him. And he's like, I'm going to get him to say it. Right. right. Like, that was it. Like, we I, we didn't force him to say it. But, I mean, we pressed it. We gave him the question. We presented the question. And he said, yeah, I'm elite. Like, and I think he believed that. And, by the way, in that January, he was. No question. No question. For that January and that first game in February, he was elite. And then 11 touchdowns, zero interceptions, uh, I mean, quarterback rating of well over 100. Unbelievable. And then the funniest part was when they were punting the ball at the very end of the game in the Super Bowl game. And he's like, the, the only way we, the only thing that happened here is to, if they run it back. And somebody said something. And Joe's like, I mean, if he comes here, I'll just tackle him. What's the penalty? I mean, right? Why wouldn't I? What's the penalty? And I really think he was serious. Like, like some, he wanted someone to say, I just looked it up. It's only 15 yards. Right. It's, yeah. it's better than a touchdown. <laughs> I think he was he's, Now he says, ah, I was only joking. I think he sounded like he was serious. <laughs> I love the look on Patrick Gleason's face on the sideline when he was saying all that. Okay. It's like, is he yeah, serious? Right. I mean, I kind of think he was serious. Oh, man. But so. he, he, hey, he had, a, he had a very, very, very good career. He was a he was a good quarterback who had some very good moments, right? I mean, he had some elite moments. Right. No, no question about it. No, and you said it best. If we're sitting here 11 years from now and Jackson did what he did, we, we'll be thrilled. And so, as a body of work, we're very thankful for Joe. 100%. Despite the frustrations on a short term level, absolutely thankful for Joe, Joe Flacco. No question about it. So. We'll see him in Denver. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for us today on the primary residential mortgage armchair quarterback. We'll see you next week.